Um, this week, the second uh, Circuit Court of Appeals basically said that the government has to release the legal guidelines for uh, creating killings, the targeted killings of uh, realms on U.S. citizens abroad. And I, I just want to, I just want to get your uh, perspective on that. I guess what, what, what did the CIA tell itself that? Uh, that was the legal standard that it could use uh, in creating that list, and what do you think will, be, will come of that information being released? Well, um, the uh, that yeah, I mentioned this earlier in my, in my earlier answers, Professor Chesney. The uh, that opinion, you know, was was prepared by Officer Leo Counsel after I resigned, so I have no idea what's in it. Sure, sure. I say I found it a bit ironic the Obama administration was so zealously protecting its OLC opinions. Well, well, having previously thrown out the door of the Bush era opinions, but be that as it may, I think the, I think, um, you know, it's funny, it's, it's funny, not funny. It was always ironic to me about the drone program over the years. The drone program started about the same time the interrogation program started, 2002. All those years, subsequent years, where the, where the interrogation program was, was you know, just a you know, just sort of such roiling emotional controversy. You know, a, a admittedly brittle program, but to interrogate and to get information from terrorists. At the same time, the drone program was already underway, in which terrorists were getting killed, I mean, blown to bits from 30,000 feet for all the world to see. Sometimes innocent bystanders along the way. Never mind that, that the uh, the American citizens were being targeted, which was not done, by the way, during the time I was there. But yet, yet, during all that time, there, you know, none, no one in Congress, I must say no, no human rights group or civil liberties group ever protested a program that's basically targeting people for death, while at the same time, um, uh, you know, the, the interrogation program was such subject to such, such, a, such criticism. I always found, you know, somehow, until relatively recently, it seemed to be the consensus, political and in, in, in the media, that it was more justifiably and legally defensible to kill a terrorist than it was to capture and aggressively interrogate one. And I never quite myself reconciled. Now, the effect of this opinion coming out, I mean, I don't know, you know, it's not, I mean, frankly, it's not a huge secret that, I mean, the administration, you know, or, you know, when al Awlaki, the American citizen, was killed, they, you know, they, they were not, they were not uh, shy about saying that, the, the, I think the president himself took personal responsibility for having made that decision. So I don't think it's going to cause any more, you know, uh, uh, controversy than, than, uh, than what, what, it's, uh, what it's done already. I honestly, I don't, I don't, you know, the drone program, in some respects, is still classified, so I can't, for instance, get too detailed in my own role on that over the years. Uh, but it's not like this is some huge revelation, so I think, I think the impact will be, you know, pretty, pretty uh, limited, and, you know, people will basically already know what happened, so. Yes, ma'am. Well, on the latter, yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, yeah, I think that, I mean, that's been, you know, a lot, a lot of the criticism. And I, and also, don't forget the moral stain on the United States. I mean, uh, I mean, I don't, I don't dispute that. Uh, uh, yeah. Now, did it, as it, as it caused Al Qaeda to operate more brutally than they had been before? And that's a hard one for me, because, in his interrogation program it didn't start till several months after the 3,000 Americans were murdered. Uh, so I mean, for my money at least, Al-Qaeda was fairly brutal beforehand. I can't, you know, on the scale of things, I don't know, I don't know how much more brutal and, and, and ruthless and merciless they could have been. So, so that, 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 that criticism, uh, 
you know, I just, I just don't find, I just don't find that persuasive. But I mean, as I say, I won't, I won't personally, I mean, we can all speak for ourselves, but I won't gainsay the fact that this, that, that the program, since exposed, is probably not, certainly not deterred people from, from uh, bad people from joining Al-Qaeda. Uh, you know, that's one of the, that's one of the main dilemmas that made, it, at the beginning of this program, made it, you know, made it so vexing for a lot of us, because we knew, we knew there would, you know, when they came out, and we knew, I knew at least, eventually it was going to come out. It was going to, there would be a large parts of the world that would, that would say the very things that they've said. But given the context of the times and the risks and the overriding need, in our view, to prevent another catastrophic attack, we, we decided to proceed uh, nonetheless. And I guess historians will be judging the implication of that decision forever. Yes, sir. Can I make the ultimate decision as to which techniques seem to be used and for how long? Who did? Yeah. Um, the, the particular, yeah, the, the particular techniques would, were CIA. I mean, were CIA, the operational calls were made by, were made by CIA. The, the decision to employ the techniques I mean, you know, the, basically the laundry list of techniques before it began. I've gone over the Justice Department legal rule, but it was also approved from, from a policy perspective uh, by, you know, the highest level, policy making levels of the Bush administration. And I might add, in the early years, the leadership of the Congress. The program was, this has gotten lost sometimes in, in the, in, in the uh, ensuing years, but this program, all the techniques and what we're going to do and how we're going to do it, we're told to the so-called Gang of Eight, which is basically the eight leaders of Congress beginning in 2000, well, it began when the program started in 2002. And there was, I will tell you, because I was at some of those briefings, there were, and this was bipartisan, of course, you know, leaders on both sides, you, you know, not a, not a word of concern or, or um, criticism. The only questions we're getting those, at least those first two years, was, is this enough? Is this all you're doing? Is there any, you know, are there other techniques you think would work and you don't, you know, you're shy about them because we're going to back you up? I mean, it was a direct quote. So, now as time went on, that changed. But, but in terms of, you know, I, I said that three people have been waterboarded. The decision to waterboard an individual uh, was made by uh, CIA counterterrorism people. And I was, you know, I was aware all the way. So Congress is fully aware of this from the beginning. Well, I mean, I, you know, I've got to be fair here. It's not all of Congress. And that's one of the, one of the big regrets I have about this program, for which I'm, I bear some responsibility, is that we didn't tell more people in Congress about this program. I mean, I think we should have told, in retrospect, the entire 15 members of the House Intelligence C Committee and 17 on the Senate Intelligence Committee. I think I have those numbers approximately right. We should have told everyone. Uh, rather than the, the leadership. It was a, a White House decision to limit it. But at least, you know, for the leadership of Congress, I mean, I'll just tell you that there was absolutely uh, uh, no objection. Yes, sir. You mentioned uh, briefly the fact that a couple of the FBI agents after, uh, after the fact uh, claimed that there was uh, effective, uh, technique, effective information uh, gathered, valuable, without resorting to martial mm -hmm. which makes me Think, thinking back in that time frame about uh, the, how blurry the line was and possible competition between the, the CIA and the FBI. Can you talk a little bit about that dynamic? Yeah, yeah. Uh, one thing, uh, it, you know, it's an interesting, interesting the FBI CIA dynamic. You know, 9 11 changed so many things, but one of the things that changed in my mind was the FBI CIA uh, dynamic. For most of my career, the FBI and the CIA were, you know, Jupiter and Mars, or was it Mars and Venus, whatever, whatever. Uh, I didn't meet an FBI guy until I was 15 years into my career. I mean, that's how separate they were. 9-11, you know, it's not like it was a kumbaya moment between FBI and CIA, but we both, both agents, I think, knew that if there was a, a, another catastrophic attack, you know, apart from the sheer tragedy of that, it would probably have meant the end institutionally of both our organizations. So, so we were sort of thrown together, and the relationship today is much better. As I indicated earlier, 
at the time, the decision was made to use the techniques on Zubeda. He had been, uh, I think I knew this at the time. Honestly, those days were so frenzied, I can't remember now what I knew then. But I think I was aware that he'd been jointly interrogated by FBI and CIA. Uh, when the techniques were being considered, the FBI leadership in Washington, including my counterpart at the FBI General Counsel's Office, said that the FBI, if these techniques were, were approved, they could no longer participate in the interrogation because, you know, they had, and it was understandable, FBI has a certain rules, regulations about the kinds of interrogations it does, and it doesn't include this kind of extraordinary measure. So I understood that. But I never heard, I never heard from anyone in Washington, FBI Washington, at the time, that they thought they were making progress in the interrogation. And I, you know, I would have thought that, that and we had several meetings with high-level FBI officials. Someone would have said that at the time because I would have remembered it because it would have had an impact on me because it wasn't like I was eager to have the, suck the agency into this thing. So that never occurred for whatever reason. Uh, you know, the prime FBI uh, 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 sp spokesman for this, uh, this, uh, this position uh, is... Uh, a guy, a seasoned FBI uh, interrogator, um, and I never, I never heard his name at the time. I mean, I'm, you know, he's, Ali Sufan is his name, but I never heard that at the time. I would have liked to have heard it. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying he's making it up, but I just, it just, I mean, when he first started saying these things years later, three years ago actually, you know, I was very puzzled because I had never heard this at the time. So that's all I can tell you on that score. Yes, sir. Could you speak about the rendition uh, specifically when it started and what you thought of the program? Yeah. Well, rendition, um, uh, I know, just, just for those, probably most of you know this already, but you know, rendition is when a, a bad guy, I mean, horribly paraphrasing this, but when there is a terrorist or other bad guy in one country that can't be, that can't be gotten by, say, the United States or normal extradition processes, a rendition is when you go in there covertly, grab them, either with or with the, with the host country being aware of it, and take them, you know, sometimes in the United States, sometimes to a third country. That's rendition. Renditions didn't start, it was not a post-9-11 phenomenon. Uh, they go back, at least in my experience, to at least the Clinton administration, where, where people who are were bad guys of various kinds had been, had been rendered, uh, as I say, mostly back to the United States. I mean, but as a principle, it even goes beyond that. I mean, Adolf Eichmann, Israel going to Argentina in 1960, snatching him and bringing him back to Israel to stand trial, that was a rendition. The, the CIA shooter, remember in 1993, the uh, Miram Mokanzi randomly shot and killed three CIA officials uh, trying to en enter the premises, en enter headquarters. He was hiding out in Pakistan, the FBI went over it. It was a rendition because the Pakistani government politically couldn't, you know, couldn't, couldn't be seen to be cooperate in extradition. So renditions were, I mean, it's, it, they weren't frequently used, and they actually weren't frequently used after 9-11, but, you know, it was, and I try to get into this in the book, I mean, it's not an, it was not a new phenomenon. And I will also say that, that the Obama administration, because I was there, I can, you know, I can testify this firsthand, in that very same executive order where he abolished the interrogation program, you know, I saw that executive order the day before it was going to be issued. And, you know, the fact that he was abolishing the interrogation program was no surprise. But he also, there was also language in it, sort of inartfully crafted, that basically would have forbidden CIA from doing renditions. And so I called my counterpart at the White House, a guy named Greg Craig, a new White House counselor, I said, and this was subsequently reported in the New York Times years later, not, you know, not, not based on me, but somebody else. Uh, and it's true, but I told him, look, you're about to take us out of the rendition business. Is this what you guys want? And he said, no, no, we don't want that. We don't want that. The president doesn't want that. I said, well, if he signs this, I'm telling you, as long as I'm chief legal counsel, I can't approve any more renditions. 
So he said, hold on, hold on, hold on. So some sort of furious back and forth inside the White House, which I was not privy to. Next thing I knew, the executive order signed the next day, and I look at the language, and it's been tweaked. But it doesn't say renditions will continue. It doesn't use the word rendition. It calls them short-term transfers will be continued. Short-term transfers. <laughs> That's what they called it. So to this day, if people think that renditions have been ended, don't, they have not. The, and I'm not criticizing the administration for this, but I'm just saying it's a, it's a technique that has been long used and actually long recognized as, uh, as uh, legitimate, and it continues to be legitimate to this day. Uh, let me see if someone wasn't. Yes. Yeah, well, I try to I try to inject a little humor uh, now and again in the book. Um, I don't know, what, you know, I could go through several of them. Um, the one that uh, it's interesting, and I've done this book tour, I've been all over the place, and it's interesting how different audiences uh, ask about different parts of the book. Most of the most of the discussions, understandably, have been about the post 9/11 stuff. But when I was in L.A., I've been in L.A. a couple times. Uh, there was one brief, like two-page thing in the book about CIA's relationship with Hollywood, uh, which I thought was interesting. Uh, I was actually a little surprised CIA let me talk about it in the book, but it's basically CIA for years, since I've been there, has employed the services of big, big time Hollywood actors, producers, directors to carry out intelligence activities, perfect cover. And these guys do it, one, because they're patriotic, and two, because, as I say in the book, you know, the way it was explained to me by the guy who handled our Hollywood account, that these people make a ridiculous amount of money, and they know what they do basically is ephemeral and meaningless. And so they're, <laughs> so they're basically, you know, they want, they want, they want, they're sincerely patriotic, but they want a little taste of real life, life intrigue. Anyway, that's just preamble. The head of the Hollywood account came in to me, this was back in the early 80s. He said, I couldn't, I couldn't give the name of the actor, but believe me, it was a big time actor. Now dead, by the way, which I, well, I thought I could use his name, but I couldn't. But he came to, came to CIA indirectly through one of his other Hollywood buddies who was working for CIA. He said, I want to help, you know, I love my country. I don't want any money. I just want to do whatever you guys want me. You want me to, you know, want me to do a voiceover pro propaganda film? I'll do that. If you, I'm making this picture in somewhere in, at that point was the Soviet Union or so. You know, if you want me to, you know, report back or you want me to talk to certain people, because one thing about Hollywood people, they have access to all these foreigners that we could never, you know, ourselves ever get to. So, we, so the Hollywood guy explained all this to me. And, uh, you know, like many times in my CR career, people, with the spooks would come to me with an idea. And I'm listening to it, I'm saying, well, this sounds fine. Why are you telling me? I mean, why, what's the problem here? Well, then you got the kicker. You say, I don't want any money. He's adamant about that, but he... Because all he wants is the best $50,000 stash of coke we could come up with. Because <laughs> he seemed to be confident CIA could get the primo stuff. Direct quote. <laughs> and so, um, so this is the kind of stuff CIA yeah, law school doesn't prepare you for. So uh, uh, I said, no, no, no. Uh, we can't do that. He said, you know, we do know where to get some. I said, don't, don't. Uh, uh, and a long story short was the guy was, you know, the Hollywood guy was sort of crestfallen. He said, well, I guess, you know, I guess I you know, figured I'd ask anyway. I said, that's fine. And I'm told the guy, the actor, did perform services, and I was always assured it was for absolutely nothing. So, I mean, there were a number of stories like that. I mean, the you know, CIA was not one, for me, one unrelenting nightmare. I mean, it was, it was uh, I mean, God help me, it was a fun place to be for a long time. Uh, yes, in the back. Yeah, I don't, you know, I had many, many lucky breaks during my career, and one of the biggest lucky breaks was that was one year I was on a sabbatical. <laughs> and uh, 
had I still been the lawyer for the spies, at, which is what I was for several years, I would have been right in the middle of that. So to answer your question, it was it was a it was a feckless shoot in the foot exercise for CIA to have got involved in. As you, as you know, at least the part about diverting sales. First of all, you know, it always been policy from every administration up to that point, including the Reagan administration in office, that you don't you don't ransom you don't ransom for for hostages, and these are American hostages. So they give them around, they sell them around these missiles, and then they turn around and. Ali North, who I talk about in the book, turns around and, and they, yeah, divert it to the Contras, which is absolutely illegal. And so it was, it was you know, to me it was indefensible. Uh, and it caused, you know, another one of these controversies that the CIA got involved in, uh, of its own making, and, and it nearly brought down the institution in the late 1980s. So, I mean, my role, in, my role in that affair, mercifully, was, was in the aftermath where I was a focal point between CIA and the committees investigating the Iran-Contra affair. Now, that was a fascinating experience for me. Sort of the, I think it was a turning point, really, professionally for me. It was my first involvement in a big-time Washington media spy scandal. So, so I, you know, as I say in the book, I mean, God help me, but that was that was, you know, for the agency was a gruesome year, but for me it was, it was just absolutely fun as hell, so. Yes, sir. I take it you uh, submitted your manuscript to the review board before it was published? I did, I was required to, yeah. Yeah, I, everything I write, I wrote a couple of op-eds in the last few weeks, everything has to go to the CIA first for review, you yeah. know. Would you like to know how they, how much they took out? Because that's usually the follow-up question. Sir, no, it's a, dip, it's a different group. It's called the Publications Review Board. Now, I will say that the head of it is a lawyer. It's a lawyer I hired 20 years ago. So um, uh, I don't think I got any special treatment, but the fact of the matter is they didn't take very much out. Um, uh, and, they were, and they were pretty prompt about it. Again, I, full disclosure, I also had written the rules internally at CIA about review of mans manuscripts. So I knew writing this where the lines were. So. It made it easier. Yes, sir. Who all is subject to that, those set of rules? Just how high these ex CIA people were? Everybody, everybody. I mean, it's one of the, you know, the heavy signed 10,000 documents signing away various rights when you join CIA. That's one. So, so it, it goes from top to, top to bottom in its lifetime. I mean, you can't, I mean, I'm, I'll have to do this for the rest of my life. Um, uh, again, you know, it's, it's one of these things I signed back when I was 28 years old. I never, you know, I had no problem with that. I didn't, you know, I had no expectation or desire, thought that I would ever want to write anything. Shows you how it's, in many ways, a career prog prognostication was never my long suit, so. Yes, sir. I believe in your book you said that you voted for Obama in I did. Well, I mean, it wasn't like McCain was supporting them. I mean, that they uh, no. I mean, one way or the other, it was clear they were going to they were going to um, the program was going to go away. And by that point, late '08, I mean, it was you know, as far as I was concerned, that was okay with me. Uh, you know, believe it or not, I I, I uh, there are other qualities I go for in the presidential candidate besides besides uh, you know his posture towards the uh, CIA. And I, I, you know, I mean, uh, Senator McCain's, a, I don't have to tell anyone about, about his, his, uh, his history, his background. I mean, it's just a national hero. But I had some dealings with him, observations about him uh, over the years. And I, I, you know, I had questions about his uh, temperament. So I opted for the new guy. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, it's funny. And it's all these years, you know, CIA just, and it's no fault. I mean, my whole career, every two or three years, CIA could be dependent on it to get, cause some sort of huge thing. 
I was always envious on the inside because there was NSA sitting out there in Fort Meade, Maryland. Many more employees in CIA. Much more money in the CIA. And yet, yet it was us who were always getting in the storms. So, so finally, after I was gone to NSA, it was NSA's turn in the docket. Um, well, I mean, I, I, I had enough trouble keeping track of CIA programs. So, so I, I was generally aware of some of the NSA, uh, post, certainly post 9 11 surveillance uh, programs, including, including the metadata program against U.S. Uh, numbers. Um, Again, it's all a question of perspective, I, and maybe I was in the inside for so long. I, I, I never had any reason to extend, like, you know, had reason to, to talk, think about it. I didn't think what NSA was doing was illegal. Uh, I didn't consider spying on U.S. citizens. Uh, it was, to me, from you know, my distance, a legitimate uh, and necessary post-9-11 uh, program. Again, one of the many criticisms the intelligence community got post 9-11 that, remember this failure to connect the dots, not having traced back, you know, terrorists traveled to the U.S. and all that. This was taken in response to that. Um, I mean, I will say this while we're on the subject of Snowden, I, you know, people have asked me about him. Um, you know, if, in full disclosure, I don't think NSA would have, would have addressed this publicly had not Snowden done what he did. So, I mean, to that small extent, you know, he could be viewed as a whistleblower. What can't be forgotten is that he didn't just steal that stuff and expose it. He took reams and reams and reams of other stuff about U.S. US spying activities overseas against foreign governments or against foreign targets, things that, you know, no one, I think, has ever seriously questioned that are legitimate for a spy agency to undertake. And he, and he, he just sucked it all up. So that, I've... I consider criminal and unforgivable. So. Final question. Yes, sir. I'm just finishing Bob Gates' book, and I can't wait to go through it. But one of the things that strikes me out of this tale is how disruptive the leaks are of an extreme epidemic across government. Although they don't seem to be that big a problem in the secret services like the CIA. What's the ch in your 30 years, of, how has the culture come to change so that uh, people at low levels or even just feel purposely at, at liberty to disclose secret stuff? And some <coughs> of it is just disruptive and other of it serious. Yeah, yeah. Well, leaks have always been with us. I mean, I remember CI directors, you know, 30 years ago railing against leaks. So it's... Not a new phenomenon, but you are, you are right. I mean, it, it's, it, <coughs> it seems to have, in, in, in the last 15 years, certainly since 9-11, seems to have just increased exponentially. I mean, I think it's a variety of factors. One, again, post-9-11 reforms was to more sharing across, you know, no stovepiping, CI shares with NSA and FBI and everybody shares with state, and so it's one, you know, we have that mesh. What that means, I mean, it sounds great, and it's a worthy goal, but more people get access to information they have no right to have, need to have access to. That's why you have Bradley Manning sitting in a, a tent, in a, a private sitting in a tent in, where was it, Iraq somewhere, pulling down State Department cables from around the world. Or we have an Edward Snowden, a 29-year-old high school dropout, a contractor, not even an employee, sitting in some, some far-out facility in Hawaii, Pulling, pulling out, I mean, frankly, all I know about what he's taken is what I read. And I'm telling you, what's been disclosed, some of that stuff I was not aware of when I was at CIA. So, so I, think that's, I, I think that's part of it. And I think, um, you know, I think, I think uh, you know, part of it, frankly, is, is there's been so much going on in the post-9-11 era that, that there's more stuff that's sort of juicy and legal. It's legable, and, and reporters want it, and, uh, and it just isn't... In, isn't the discipline there used to be? But I mean, I'm yeah. telling you, 30 years from now there'll be leaks as well. So. The CIA has thousands of employees. How do you, you all seem to prevent that? Well, we're not perfect. We're not perfect. We had we had all of our chains in the early 90s. But I, I, you know, 
Never fear the polygraph. I mean, uh, that's a, that's a, I'll tell you, that's a deterrent, a real deterrent. But, you know, there have been leaks out of CIA, too. Anyway, I appreciate all this, and uh, uh, happy to ask, answer more questions afterward. But I enjoyed being here. Thank you. Thank you, George. Okay.